Our first scripture lesson this morning is from Psalm 96. You can find that on page 519 of your pew Bibles. You may not know it, but the Psalms, many scholars believe, are actually broken up into five books that are intended to tell the story of Israel in chronological order. And so, book one is David's reign, books two and three, the divided monarchy, book four, the time of exile, and then book five, the return from exile and the rebuilding. This morning's psalm is Psalm 96, found in book four, which is Psalms 90 through 120, and that is the time of exile. And so we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. For now, we'll hear the Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. Then our gospel is from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, found on page 896. The way our lectionary cycle works is dependent on when Easter falls as to how long ordinary time is. Now, ordinary time is the time that stretches from after Pentecost all the way until Advent starts this year in December. And so when Easter falls really early, like it did this year, we have an extended period of ordinary time. And what that means is we actually can get a lesson or two that we don't normally get in the cycle. And that's the case for this week. This is the fourth time I've been through year C, and we have yet to do this lesson. So this is a probably an unfamiliar story to you from Luke. This is, uh, Jesus is going into Capernaum. He runs into a centurion who is a a Roman soldier, and the centurion is one who shows quite a bit of faith. So, as I said, perhaps an unfamiliar story to you here in chapter 7. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. May God's blessing be upon the hearing and the understanding of this holy word. So if you peruse any of the more reputable theological booksellers online, in other words, the ones that don't have religious fiction about a Rambo-like Jesus ending the world on their bestseller lists, if you peruse those, you will probably notice a trend these days. Many of the books deal in some way with the change that the church is currently undergoing. This giant rummage sale, as author Phyllis Tickle calls it, happens every 500 years in Christianity, with the church throwing out what it once was in order to become what it will be. 
Well, my friends, you probably don't have to look too far around you to realize that here in the year 2013, we find ourselves knee-deep in our grandfather's flannel shirts and the faded rock concert t-shirts of yesterday. The church is not who we once were, and we are not yet who we will someday become. Yet that doesn't mean that lots and lots of people don't have an opinion as to where we're going. One such author penned an article entitled, 11 Traits of Churches That Will Impact the Future. In it, he lists the characteristics of churches that churches will need to have if, in his opinion, they are to have a positive impact on the future of faith. And this is his list. The ability to say no to members who want things the way they have always been and a willingness to say yes to ideas that might reach out to new folks. An outsider focus. A church that looks beyond its walls to care for those around them. Quick decision making. That is, actually letting an idea happen without getting bogged down in committees and Robert's rules of order ad nauseum. A flexibility to change our methods to meet the new needs and challenges of the world. A realization that churches are getting smaller. And an embracing of that size diminishment without always yearning to get bigger, which will lead to the church having a bigger impact. A lighter footprint. That is, less buildings and maintenance and overhead to bog down ministry. Valuing online relationships as real relationships. An openness to questions without a desire to answer them with quick, easy fixes. A willingness to experiment and know that not all of those experiments are going to work. A focus on what we can do for other people, in other words, how we can serve them, as opposed to what people can do for us. And finally, a tailoring of the worship experience to reach an increasing number of people who are unfamiliar with what churches do on Sunday mornings. So that's this author's list. Some of his ideas are no-brainers, some a little far-fetched, some you may agree with, some you may not. But one thing is th certain, I think they all have something to say to that psalm we read a few moments ago. So I invite us now to turn our attention back to before the church had that first rummage sale to celebrate Jesus' birth. For today, Psalm was written somewhere around the year 587 B.C. when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians and the Israelites were forced into exile. And what we have here is what is known as an enthronement psalm. Referring to Psalm 93 and then Psalms 95 through 99, these psalms, some will suggest, were originally used in pre-exilic Israel during the New Year's festival, an annual commemoration of God as victorious king over the earth. Now I know you're probably all saying to yourselves, well, how does a pre-exilic psalm come in a section that was supposedly written when the Israelites were in exile? That's what you were all thinking, right? <laughs> if so, well done. You're very astute this morning. Many will share that same question with you. Especially since the evidence for a pre-exilic New Year's festival ever happening is minimal. So welcome, my friends, to the world of biblical scholarship. Many, many theories, many, many questions, and not a whole lot of answers out there. And yet, while we don't know really when this psalm was written, most scholars I read agree on one thing. In this psalm, the psalmist is calling on the listeners to sing a new song to God. However, in picking up this theme that is also found in Isaiah 40 through 55, you're probably not going to be surprised to learn that scholars are not of one mind as to what that new song might be. It might actually be that the psalm itself is the new song. That's right, this psalm may be the ancient equivalent of the new century hymnal. The same themes, perhaps tunes even, but different words used to praise God. Or it may be that the, psalm, the new song is in response to a historical event, something that God is doing for Israel while in exile. Or it may be that the psalm is not so much about in celebration of what God has done, but in anticipation of what God will do. We'll sing a song of praise because we're anticipating that God is going to do something new very soon. It could be any of these. But the reality is that these options are not mutually exclusive, so there may be a little bit of all of this in this new song that the Israelites are being called to sing. But in the end, all that really matters is that the listeners, which include all of us here today, are being called to sing a new song of praise. That's what this psalm is at its heart. Yet to sing such a song is no small feat, as one writes, 
To join in singing Psalm 96 is to affirm that we have made a crucial decision. We have decided that even amid the discouraging realities we confront every day, new things are possible and a new song can be sung. And those words should ring true for all of us, given that we find ourselves amid shelves of books and sorting through the torn genes of yesterday, trying to figure out how this church can have an impact on our future. We are indeed being called to sing a new song. Actually, called is probably too nice a word. For in many ways, we have no choice but to sing a new song. Because the reality is, if we keep singing the same song that we've been singing, the church isn't going to be singing much at all. A few statistics, though there are a lot we could turn to, should suffice. From 1975 to 2008, church attendance rates fell from 32 to 24%. In 1960, those who labeled themselves as unaffiliated or none of the above as to religious belief and practice were barely registering on the polls. By 1972, they had bumped up to 5% of the population. Today, they make up 16 to 20% of the population. And at this rate of growth, they will actually outnumber Christians by the year 2042. 44% of Americans have left their childhood faith in favor of another denomination or religion or are no longer affiliating with any tradition. The biggest gainer in new adherents you guessed it, those who now label themselves as unaffiliated. And finally, as if these statistics weren't bad enough, in a survey of young adults outside the church, 91% viewed Christianity as anti-homosexual, 87% said it is judgmental, 72% said it is out of touch with reality, and only 30% said that Christianity is relevant to their lives. Seems like it's time for a new song, don't you think? Author Diana Butler Bass, echoing those 11 traits we started with, I believe may have her hand on just what that song might be. Noting that in modern times, religion became indistinguishable from systemizing ideas about God, she suggests that that new song may really not be all that new, but more of a great returning to the ancient understanding of finding a forgotten path of wonder and awe through the wilderness of human chaos and change. Moving away from believing as an intellectual assent to an idea, she suggests that Christianity is shifting away from being a belief-centered religion to an experiential faith. In other words, the church is shifting from thinking about our faith inside the sanctuary to living out our faith outside these four walls. It's a shift that's actually noted perfectly in the last two vision statements that this church has undertaken. In looking back at the records in 1999 this week, which was the last time we went through such a process, I was amazed to discover the ideas that were being batted around for a vision of our church then. More laity and men's and women's Sundays, visiting the sick and the shut-ins, finding a part-time Sunday school director, more devotions during meetings, more spiritual discussion groups, to name just a few. Now, did you notice anything about those ideas? They were all inwardly focused. Now that's not to say that those who created them, some of whom may be in this room right now, were wrong or that these were bad ideas. Far from it. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that it illustrates a shift that the church as a whole is undertaking when we look at the vision statement that we'll be voting to affirm after worship says. Rather than focusing inward, that vision statement focuses outside these walls, full of action words and verbs, like practicing hospitality, Inviting new people, responding to the needs of the marginalized and the poor. Service in the community, leaving worship strengthened to serve. Responding to trends in our local community, putting our faith into action, leveraging technology to further our ministry, again, to name a few. Unless you think that these are ideas that a small committee came up with, these are your ideas. Glean from that survey that we sent out, the conversations we had, and the observations that we have made about who we are and who we would like to become. Harry, Linda, Mark, Chuck, Valerie, Gail, and I quickly realized that the church is moving into something new as we close in on our 300th birthday. And so we created a vision statement that we hope will help us as a congregation begin the journey into what we will become to start to sing a new song to worship our God. Now, clearly not all of the answers are on that vision statement, 
There is much work, conversation, prayer, reflection that needs to be done. So consider these the first notes of the song that we will be singing together. Today we are simply hoping that you will affirm that we are starting in the right key. Because this is an important song for us to sing. It's an important song that the world needs to hear. And so my hope and my prayer is that whether you sing with gusto or simply mouth the words, whether you have perfect pitch or think you can't carry a tune in a bucket, my hope is that you'll be moved to lend your voice to what I know can be an amazingly beautiful melody. Amen. <clears throat> Let us join together in song now.